So Colossians chapter 3 this morning, verses 23 and 24. <coughs> whatever you do, whatever you do, do it heartily or wholehearted. As to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that from the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. Our key verse, of course, do everything heartily as to the Lord. This is our focus. This is our remembrance that we serve God. It's sometimes difficult because we don't see him. It's hard for us to always know and understand and always be in his presence when he's not seeable. But it's our requirement. It is our requirement to serve God. It is our requirement to do. It is our requirement to live as though he is always standing before us. It makes the most mundane task an important task if it's done for Christ. Paul has just finished, if you have read the chapter, this is the chapter where he says, children, Obey your parents. And all the parents say, Amen, you preach it, brother. And then he says, Wives, be obedient to your husbands. And wives say, Let's pass over that verse. Because <laughs> we like the next one that says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And all the women say, Amen. We like that first one. We like that second one. And then he goes on, he says, servants or slaves, serve your master without grumbling, without complaining. Of course, you and I don't necessarily uh, or don't consider ourselves slaves, but we all work for someone. We have some entity that writes a check for us weekly. We punch a clock somewhere. And so we are servants. And we're supposed to do that service without grumbling, without complaining. And it's hard sometimes not to grumble and not to complain. Because we might not like our boss. We might not like our supervisor. We might not like whoever's in charge. It's one of the things that people who go to work like to do. We like to drink our coffee, sit together, and complain about the guy up there. It's just part of humanity. But we're not allowed to. Because our boss is the Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever that guy is up there in that front office, between him and me is the Lord Jesus Christ, and when that man gives an order, he gives it to the Lord, and then the Lord brings it over to me and says, oh, hey, by the way, I'd like for you to go and do such and such a thing. And it changes the way we see things if we were to look like that as to the Lord. Now, the work we do, it's an honorable service when you consider it that way. We serve the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. You know what they call the servants of the King? They call them nobles. A king has those below him. You, some of you, or at least you heard about, there was a wedding in England. Right? And all the lords and ladies were there. And they're given fancy titles, the Duke and the Duchess of this. You know what a Duke and a Duchess is? They are the servants of the king. The prince and the princesses, servants to the king. 
All those high sounding titles at work, for example, we have a CEO. He's the big cheese guy. But he works for a board that employ him. Under him, there are vice presidents. And you know what vice presidents are? They're servants to the CEO. They're the servants of the president. Nice title, directors and supervisors. They all sound good, but really what they are are just servants to somebody above them. They may have a fancier sounding title than I have, but they got the same job. They're the servants of whoever's above them, and I serve whoever's above me. In my case, though, I serve the Lord Jesus Christ. So I suppose somewhere there's waiting for me a fancy title. I know there's somewhere waiting for me a crown. I am joint heir with Jesus Christ. But I'm also his servant at the same time. Jesus Christ, who was the Son of God, was he not also the servant of the Father? Did he not come to do the Father's will? Not my will, but yours be done, he prayed. Didn't that make him, although equal with God, wasn't he also willing to serve God? It's a very honorable work we do serving others because that serving others is really for us serving God. We are, after all, considered kings and priests with him. What noble titles we have. It is a most honorable service to be the servant of Jesus Christ. But to be the servant of Christ, we must be the servant of all. It is considered not only an honorable service, but a reasonable service. Right away your mind probably went to Romans 12 1 which we are reminded that we are to live a acceptable holy life which is to God our reasonable and this word reasonable means if you stopped and thought it through you would agree with God. To serve Jesus Christ is the reasonable thing to do. After all, he is God. And God is entitled to have my service. If I sat and reasoned it out, I would come to the conclusion that everything I do is for him. And that being for him, I should do my best at it. The master has a claim on a slave. In fact, the master doesn't only own the slave, but he owns everything that the slave owns. If you were my servant, if you were my slave, everything in your house was probably given to you by me. The chair you sit on when you eat your dinner, the table that you sit at, all those things were provided for you by me. Therefore, I have a right. If I wanted to take your table and chair, I could take your table and chair because they're rightfully mine. In fact, being my servant or being my slave in the old days required that your wife was my slave. If I say to your wife, I don't want you in this field, I want you to go work in that field, your wife would leave this field and she'd go and work. And she didn't have to get your permission to do what I told her to do. Your children that were born to the wife that I probably gave you would be my slaves as well. And I would say to your children, carry this bucket for me or go do this thing for me. And they would do it. Everything you owned as a servant, everything you owned as a slave was mine. That was how it went. It could be a difficult thing to comprehend and to understand. And, and you have to remember, when this book was written, that was a reality in life. Many of those who came to Jesus Christ, many of those who came to accept the Lord as their Savior, were slaves. 
living somewhere under those kinds of conditions. And so Paul says to them, it's a reasonable thing for you to obey that man. It is a reasonable thing when you look at him to see the face of Jesus Christ in your master. Because you're not serving that master. You're serving Christ who allowed you to be born into that situation. Now that changed everything. If suddenly I am serving Jesus by serving that man, it made it easier for me to serve that man. It was reasonable to consider that. You were bought with a price, were you not? The price, price represented by the cross. The price, the absence of Christ from heaven for all those 30 some odd years where he left his home in heaven to live down here for those 30 years that he might die for you and for me. That was our cost for him to give us to the Father. It was a cost of love. Did you ever hear Christ grumbling, complain on that cross? Are there any words recorded in Scripture? Four men bear witness to the scene of the cross. And none of those men bother to say, oh, by the way, you should have heard him scream and holler your name because you put him there. You don't get that. Father, forgive them, you hear. It is finished. It is complete. Father, I have done what you've asked me to do. And now I commend my spirit to you. No grumbling, complaining, because he saw it as his reasonable service to serve the Father. And by serving the Father, he served me in taking my place. And now I serve him in taking his place. He's no longer here to meet the needs of people. He took my place there, took my sins away. I remain here to take his place now in serving people. So it is a reasonable, well thought out service. Also, as we said, it is the, an entire service. As I said already, everything that I owned, I received from my master. My family, myself, my belongings. So Christ claims my time, my talent, and my treasures. I am a steward of Jesus Christ. That's how the New Testament puts it, steward. A steward was a fancy name for a servant. The steward was in charge of the other servants, but the steward was himself still a slave, working for the master. The steward would go and buy and do the business of the master. He would spend the master's money. He would beat the master's servants. He would, for all intents and purposes, when the servants saw the steward, they saw the master. When the businessman came to deal with the master, he never saw the master. He dealt with the steward. The steward would write the checks. The steward could go down and buy. Remember the story of the good steward? The, the evil, the wicked steward? Who took the man's money and says, oh, how much you owe my master? Hundred? Write and say you owe him fifty. The steward had that kind of authority over the master's stuff. He could treat it like it was his own, but it wasn't. That's why he was the evil steward. Because he took what belonged to the master and treated it as his own and lied to the master about what he did with it. You and I, we look around at all that we have and we say, look what I have. And God says, you don't really have nothing. I have it. You're my steward. I'm letting you, the Lord says, Terry, I'm letting you drive around in my red convertible. Thanks. Appreciate that. Oh, here, I'm going to let your wife drive around in this black van. Cool. You know, I'm going to let Michael drive around in that there Honda car. I'm going to let Cake drive around in that there Altima. Uh, but if he ever wants them back, there he is. Everything. Because I'm only a steward. The house I have, 
belongs to God. The job I have belongs to him as well. He could take it from me or leave me employed there as long as he wants. I'm his steward. My time isn't my own. I've been bought. My talents are not my own. I have been bought. He could tell me what to do. I want you to go do this. I want you to go do that. I want you to be a preacher. I want you to be this. I want you to be... He had every right to tell me what to do and I have every responsibility to be that thing for him. Entire service. I don't get to withhold any... I don't get to tell him no. You don't get to tell God no. We do, but we don't get to. It's not right. But he also promises this. He promises us that it would be a happy service. You know, sometimes the road is rough, I'll grant you that. But when you consider who you're traveling that highway with, it makes all the difference in the world. When we consider that um, his, there's a story about uh, Brutus and um, Ligarius. Ligarius is sick and he's at home. Brutus stops by to visit. Brutus gets there and he sees that Ligarius is sick and he says, oh, Ligarius, you sick? And Ligarius looks at him and says, not if you have anything for me to do, I'm not. He wanted to serve. If you have something noble for me to do, if you have something important for me to do, if you've got something for me to do, then no, I'm not sick. If Jesus Christ finds me someday and I don't feel well and he says, you know what, I still need you to do something, I'm going to get up off that bed and I'm going to go do it. Look at the man who was crippled all those years, laying there at the pool. What did Jesus say to him? Take up your bed and walk. What do you say to that guy they let through the window or let through the roof of his house? Take up your bed and walk. And what did they do? They took it up and they walked. They could have said, hey, you don't understand. I'm, I'm crippled here. I'm paralyzed. I can't get up and walk. Jesus said, do you want to be healed? Take up your bed and walk. And they took up their bed and they walked. It was for them a happy serve. I will gladly carry my, my, my bed today because, hey, I'm walking. I'm walking. What a happy occasion. What a happy service that was for them. And to stop and consider that Jesus Christ said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That he will walk by us every step of the way. Those are happy steps. We don't see it that way sometimes. I'll grant you that. But the truth of the matter is someday when you're sitting up in heaven and Jesus Christ is reviewing your life with you and you look at that hard and difficult moment and you see him carrying you along, you'll say, I never realized. And he said, I never forgot about you. I never left you alone. I never left you. Here, uh, not only is it happy, but consider it. Take my burden on you, for my burden is easy and it's light. Let me take that heavy burden of sin that you got and give you this lighter burden of service. I don't have the crushing weight of sin anymore, but I do have the opportunity and the privilege of service. The privilege. We think of those folks who serve inside the White House. We think of men and women who are ambassadors, all serving at the behest of the president, all with fancy titles. But really they are serving at his pleasure. He asked them to do it. And he helps them out. They're given lots of folks to help do it. See, the easy service You will, what's he promising that? Uh, take my burden on you, take my yoke upon you, and you will find, what do you find when you take his yoke? You ever look at that? Take my yoke upon you, and you will find rest. Doesn't make sense. How can I put a yoke, remember, you know what a yoke was, that's what they put to hold two cattle together as a plowed. 
And he said, listen, when you put my yoke on you, you're going to find rest. Wait, a yoke is something that you put on an animal to make them work. But Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and you will find rest. It really, it, it, it's very strange the way he phrases that and the way that the tool he uses to explain to us. How is it possible that when I am that close to Christ, and when I am serving him, I'm literally resting. When is the last time you thought that work was rest? Well, sometimes we do. We call it a hobby, don't we? And, and we have this hobby because it helps us to relax. It helps us to rest. But you're working. For some of you, it's gardening. Gardening to me is the hardest task. It's, you have to beat me with a whip to hit me go out there and do it. But for some of you with a, my, my, a big smile and you're out there moving this and picking at that and trimming this and you got a big smile and you think it's the greatest thing in all the world because you're trimming some trees or you have to beat me with a whip to keep me out there. But for you it's rest. See, the Lord says that. He says, here, take my yoke on you and you will find rest. You don't get much easier than that. Resting. Resting. Take my yoke. See, love is this power. When we are working together with Christ, it, the, the, the love we have for him is what makes the most difficult task easy to do because you're in love with somebody in our case the Lord Jesus Christ and when we yoke up with him we are yoked together with our best and it's, that leads us to this thought right here it's a service of friendship John 15, 15, and I, we use this quite often. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known to you. You and I can open our Bibles and we can go to the very end. We got Genesis where we were created and we got Revelation when we go back home. And between Genesis and Revelation, we know what God's doing in this world. We could see that, hey, they just moved the capital of Israel to Jerusalem. Do you ever read Revelation? You know, for all these years since the birth of the nation of Israel, their capital has been Tel Aviv. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that Tel Aviv this thing happens, or in Tel Aviv, that thing happens. The biblical capital of Israel is always Jerusalem. And just this last week, guess what? Jerusalem became the capital again. And when you read your Bible, understand these things. There was no Soviet Union in the Bible, it was always Russia. And guess what? Now you have Russia to the north, not the Soviet Union anymore. And now you have the capital of Israel, Jerusalem. When you read the book of Revelation, you always assumed that Russia, of course, was the Soviet Union. But how come God didn't get that name right? And we always knew that Tel Aviv was the capital, so why didn't God get that capital right? He did. He was just telling you ahead of schedule what was going to happen. And so now we are again for these few weeks now living in biblical moments where we watched God move a capital nation from this place to this place. For those who were alive back in 48 and watched the nation of Israel be born and watched as the President of the United States, Truman, recognized them 
into existence. And again, the President of the United States recognizing Jerusalem back into existence as the capital of this central nation for all that God is doing. We have to say God must be doing something again. We are this much closer to whatever God's been telling us throughout this book. I got to tell you, it is a service of friendship. God was telling his friends, you and I, what he was going to do. We have known for a long time that God was going to do this. We just couldn't get anybody to believe us. But I call you friends because I'm telling you what the Father is doing. And now as you open your Bible and you read the book of Revelation, you see what's coming to pass and you witness on those pages what's about to happen in that city. And now you say to yourself, wait, that's the capital again. These things can take place in that city just like they were supposed to do because my friend Jesus told me what his father was about to do. And you have it on very good authority. See, this is a service of friendship. I can serve Jesus Christ because he has called me friend and he has, how do I know he's my friend? Because he has told me what the Father is about. Strange people don't come by. We had, I had friends growing up, one or two of them anyway. And they'd come by and they'd say, oh, my family is going to be going on vacation. We're going to be doing this and we're going to be doing that. I never had a strange kid walk up to me, somebody I did not know, knock on my door and say, hey, you know what my parents are doing? I don't care what your parents are doing. I got, don't even know who you are, kid. But see, a friend could come up and tell you what their plans are, and it meant something. This book to a lot of people means absolutely nothing. Why? Because they aren't friends. When the kid knocks on the door and says, hey, you know what my father's doing? They don't know who Jesus is. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, we heard the voice. We have become his friends. He became important to us. We've accepted his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection as part of our forgiveness. And we have been made free. We have been made joint heirs with Jesus. He is now important. He is our friend. And so what his father is doing is important to us. So he said, I'm going to tell you what my dad's going to do. It might sound a little bit strange, but here, I, I, in fact, I wrote it all down. I asked my servant, my friend John, to write these things and send them to you in a letter so you would know what my dad and I are doing because I got to go home right now. And you might not see me for a while. But hey, here's our plans. And these are the plans we have for you. Oh, by the way, you get to come home early before any of this bad stuff happens. Because you're my friend. <laughs> Yay! Wouldn't a friend do that? A friend wouldn't want his friend to get hurt. So a friend would say, I'm going to bring you home early just before all this bad stuff takes place. Because you're my friend. This stuff is entitled to happen or expect to happen to those who aren't our friends, who haven't been friendly, who have rejected us. And my father wants to teach them a lesson about rejecting me. But you haven't, so I'm going to bring you home. You'll be safe. It's a service of friendship. I get to know what he is doing because I'm his friend. And when I serve people, I'm serving my friend Jesus Christ because that's what he wants to do. It's also a lucrative service. Lucrative means you get paid for it. You make some sire some kind of a profit. And this is pretty lucrative. Because first of all, in this world, it's lucrative in the sense that the Father takes care of me. While I am here, my service to Jesus Christ really is its own reward. To know that I have said yes to God when he has asked me a question, is really its own reward, isn't it? As I stand here and know that I am on my way to heaven because of what my friend has done for me, and that he considers me his friend, and goes around telling everybody, hey, that's my friend over there, even though he is my king. It's very lucrative. Hasn't he taken care of me? I am 62 years old and God has cared for me all these years. I was born to poor parents. I grew up in a poor home, but I'm still here. 
Somehow through that poverty, God managed to take care of, to provide for. Brought me to a woman who had $75 in the bank. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's a lucrative thing to work for Christ. And here we are all these years later, raised our children, paid our debts, and we're still here because I serve my friend, the Lord Jesus Christ. In that sense, it has been lucrative. It has been, but the greatest of all of that is that I could tell people that I have served the Lord Jesus Christ all these years. I have never turned my back on him, the one who has never turned his back on me. Like David, David who is considered to be perfect, and he's only perfect for one reason, he never served another god. He never turned, oh, he turned his back on a lot of people, but he never turned his back on God. He never sought from the gods of the nations around him, like others did. And I too, once I discovered Jesus Christ, never looked for another. Never served another. Never bowed before another. Because I have found him my greatest reward. And then, in the world to come, I am joint heir with Christ. Everything that heaven has is mine. And I'll show it to you when we get there. I'll say, see that right over there? I own part of that throne that my father's sitting on. Now, I don't get to borrow it or nothing like that. But you see, if you look real careful, somewhere around there, my name is probably etched, partly owned by. And you'll say, hey, my name's right next to you because I partly own that thing too. I'll say, oh yeah, well you see those robes them angels are wearing over there? Partly mine. And you'll say, partly mine too. And Jesus will come over and say, partly mine too. We will own equally, together with Jesus Christ, everything our eyes lay on when we get to glory. Now I got to tell you, that's pretty lucrative business. All them golden streets, if I want, I could pick up a brick because I own it. Probably won't. But if you get to heaven and you want to pick up a brick, feel free to do it. I ain't going to get in trouble for tearing up the streets. <laughs> I'll let you do that. But we're going to own everything. That's pretty lucrative. See, it's a lucrative service. If, if that's your incentive, you will have everything. You will equally own with Jesus Christ all that your eyes lay hold of in glory. That's pretty good. So, we conclude by saying this then. Since creation, God has given us work to do. Read the first few chapters. I want you to do this, I want you to learn to do this, I want you to learn to do this, I want you to learn to do this. We have work to do. If a man doesn't work, neither shall he eat. God has always intended that you and I should work and that he's always intended that we should work for him. If we could regard then our work as an act of worship or service to God, then with such an attitude that drudgery and that boredom would disappear. I am an engineer. Uh, at work, I am the big cheese guy. I'm the one everybody goes to. Other men are, we have what they call maintenance men. And maintenance people do maintenance stuff. I don't do maintenance stuff. But on Saturday, they don't have any maintenance guys there just me so on Saturday sometimes I have to do maintenance type stuff which I could look and say wait that's a little beneath me but see on Saturday I get to demonstrate that I am the servant of Jesus Christ 
I get a call and somebody says, hey, that light bulb's burned out. I could tell them, hey, well, wait till Monday and one of the maintenance guys will come by and replace that light bulb for you. Not a big thing. I could say that's beneath me and get away with it. Nobody would argue me. But that patient or that nurse in that area needs that light. If Jesus came by and said to me, would you change that light? I'd jump up there that quick. So when that person asked me, can you change? I have to see them as Jesus asking me to do it. And guess what? All of a sudden there is no job too small. I'll get up there because Christ is asking me to do it. Every job, all of a sudden, I enjoy working Saturday. I work Saturday every chance I get. Because it gives me that opportunity to be that servant. To go up and do these things because Jesus is asking me to do it. There's nobody else around to do it. So Jesus has to ask me to do it. That's how I view Saturdays. I get up. Easy enough to get up on Saturday morning. Easy enough for me to get in my car and drive to work. Not a hard thing. Why? Because it's my turn to hear Jesus say every time someone calls down, hey, we need maintenance. All right. Jesus and I will be right up there. He'll hold the ladder while I turn the light bulb. Once I begin to view it that way, how much easier it is to do my job. How much easier it is for me to put up with people. Sometimes you get folks who are pretty crabby. And I could put up with them because Jesus is with me in the room. And he wanted me to go and take care of that for that crabby person. <laughs> so it, it changes everything when you view it that way. Since creation, God has wanted us to work. If I view my work then as an act of service or an act of worship to God, then it makes it all of a sudden much, much easier and a whole lot more fun. Lord, do you see what I did for you today? My lights weren't burned out. Jesus will say, oh, yes. Remember, if you give a cup of cold water, right? Sometimes people don't know that they've entertained angels unaware. All these verses flash through your head. How do I know that God's just not testing me? If God wants me to do, I don't care how simple it is. Would you go plunger that toilet? Sure, Lord. If the toilets in heaven ever back up, I'll be the first one there. Chances are they won't. But still, as simple a job as that can be, if Christ is asking me to do it, is it not important? Is it not then honorable? Is it not lucrative? Is it not reasonable? Because he asked me to do it. Is it not a happy job? Because Christ and I are there together. I don't want him to get his hands dirty. Lord, let me do that for you. Don't want you staying in those heavenly robes of yours. You better let me get that one. Sure. See, all week long I'm spoiled by people at work who want to do everything for me because they love me. But on Saturday, I could do it for him because I love him. And that's really the important part of it, to learn. Here's a problem with being the pastor. You come to church, everybody, you're always being spoiled by somebody. Everybody looks up at you like you're important. And on Saturday, all of a sudden, I get to be nobody. Just a guy who's doing what God wants him to do. Fix a light, plunger a toilet, fix a sink, whatever it might be. As simple and as mundane as it can possibly be. Do it for him. Do it for him. That really is a secret. And finally then, we could work without complaining or resentment if we would treat our jobs and our problems as the cost of our discipleship. I'm a disciple. 
God's training me. What is it that God wants from you? So he gives you this task to do. A task that I might want to grumble about. A task that I might want to complain about. And when I learn not to complain when I want to complain, then I've learned something of Jesus Christ. When they put that nail in his hand, you did not hear him say a word. Except, Father, forgive them. At some point in time, you and I will grow to say, Father, forgive them. At the worst of times. And he will say, you're a pretty good disciple. I'm glad I started you off by doing this job and this job. And someday we're going to have to do something hard. And we're going to have to do something difficult. But you don't start off hard and difficult. You move up to hard and difficult. You start out easy. When you were a kid in school, you didn't start off in calculus. You didn't start off in algebra. You learn to add one and one. And oh, what a genius you were when you could go home and show your mom. One and one. Two. Two and two. Five. Well, I, okay, I did learn as fast as the rest of y'all. But what I'm saying is, is when you learn those things, oh, you thought you knew it all. When you could count to ten, wasn't you a genius? You heard that there was a number called 100 and someday you'd be able to get that high. And man, you looked forward to the day. You learned small steps. And God has been teaching us small steps. But someday you'll get into algebra and geometry and all the rest of those things. And some man used his math and got us to the moon and back. Pretty amazing stuff. But they started adding one and one. And so you and I will begin small with simple tasks. And when we learn not to grumble and complain, then we're ready for the cross. And we're ready to be like him. And we will call people friend. And we will tell them also what our Father is doing. You want to know what God's doing? Friend, let me tell you.